And so I had a Bruce Kilt. I was I was all out there. Yeah, yeah, you can't. I was lot. I was leaner in those days, but but I remember they march off with playing the song "Scout in the Brain." At the very end, they would play I think one of the greatest Scottish bagpipe songs of all time, "Amazing Grace." Yes. What's your feeling about that song? Well, you know, I used to uh, attend regularly a Lutheran church, and they were big on "Amazing Grace," all the uh, verses. So yeah, and then on the bagpipes, there was something about it. It is an amazing song. And so I went and did some history of that song, and that song was written in 1779 by a guy named John Newton. Now, here is, and he became, a, he was a minister in England, but his story is amazing. When he was a younger guy, he was on a slave ship. He ran a slave ship of slaves. And he, he found how bad it was, and he, and one day he decided, I can't do this anymore. And he, so he came up. Hi, everybody. It's Marty Watts with American Talk It Up. And it's episode number eight. And today, in place of Henry DeFoy, I've got a co-host today, Wally Dragmeister. Welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here, Marty. I've known Wally for a long time. Of course, you know, his father is in the Basketball NAIA Hall of Fame, right? Well, he's gotten some awards. Let's put it that way. I lose track of what all they are. But yeah, he had a great career, uh, mostly at Western New Mexico, and uh, quite a coach, quite a quite a guy, too. And I saw him play in the... I saw him coach Almagordo Tigers in 19... 68 or 69 against the famous um, Hobbs Eagles, and they had that great team. And he only yeah, Truman two. Ward was on Hobbs Eagles, but Al McGordo had some pretty good guys, LeVard Coleman, uh, Fred Henry, who ended up being a uh, running back for UNM. And played for Rocky Long. So yes. Your dad is a legend. Of course, your uncle's a legend in, in, in coaching. but I'm the only one who's not a legend, Marty. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm a legend. I'm a legend. <laughs> well, I'm a legend in my own mind. That's as far uh, as yeah, I Yeah, that's what I am. <laughs> Hey, but you know what? I want to talk about the 1918 pandemic. Since we're talking about the the the, uh, the virus, yes, the the, the Corona 19, Co yeah, COVID 19, Corona, SARS, SR, <coughs> you know, there's some numbers, but yes, SR two. And we normally we start out with a sports story, but here's here's the story. This thing in 1918 really affected my my family. Because in 1918, April the 5th, my grandfather, Martin Luther Watts, the original Martin Luther Watts, he owned a, he owned a store in Coos, Oklahoma. It's right next to Henrietta. They had, a, they had a, a brick factory and a smelter there, and he had a general store called the Watts General Store. And he, uh, he opened up in 1912, and so he had a thriving store going. And he and my and my grandmother, uh, they had they had three kids, and she was pregnant with my dad. And five days before he died of the flu, he was he got a call from an Oklahoma City bank, and he wanted to go out and expand his store to five other cities. It's like a little you know a chain of stores called the Watts Store. And so anyway. He came down with the virus. He he came down with the flu. The right. flu. They called was it the Spanish flu or swine flu? Well, it ended up becoming the Spanish flu, but you know they think it might have started in the Midwest of the United yeah. States and went all around the world uh, with World War II and moving troops, helping to spread it quicker than maybe it would have otherwise. World War so, One. Yeah, World War One. Excuse me, I was off by one. Sorry about that. So, no, World War One. Sorry. So here's what I know. From what my research, the the virus, the the flu epidemic actually started somewhere in Leavenworth, Kansas, and his store was about less than 90 miles from where the epidemic centered. And so in those days, when you walked in the store, you usually shook hands with the customer and, yeah. and say welcome to the store. And that's probably how he got. It. He shook hands with somebody, and he died about five days later. It was late March. He died on April the 5th. He was 34 years old. My grandmother was pregnant with my dad, so my dad never met him. Yeah. And and after after that, his his partner was my grandmother's uh, brother, who 
didn't wasn't much of a business guy and he didn't last another year so they were pretty destitute when he died yeah. but the other story i have another grandfather named charles beecham from el reno oklahoma and he signed up in the army in early january and he went to fort dodge iowa with the troops they were training and his best friend was a guy named willie smith they were next door farmers and they grew up together. It was like the buddy system. And they joined the army in World War One and they were there at Fort Dodge to get ready to go to Europe to fight the battle. And then in early late March, he comes down with the flu. The whole army barracks came down. A lot of them didn't make it. And so his unit he did not go to he stayed at Fort Dodge until October. He was if it was that bad. He yeah. he did recover. But his buddy, Willie Smith, went over overseas and got killed in the Battle of Bella Wood, one of the famous battles. I think Douglas MacArthur was the general in that battle in World War I against the Germans. He didn't come back. And so if my grandfather didn't come with the flu, he might have got killed in, in the war, in the battle. Yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, I mentioned to you, I just got through reading uh, a book called The Great Influenza by a guy named John M. Barry. And it's... It's the book about the about the 1918 influenza. And, you know, when we were kind of locked down here a few months ago and not able to go out at all, uh, everything was shut down. I, I happened to have this recommended by a friend. And as you said, one of the things that was striking was there was all these uh, military training bases and training camps set up throughout the country to prepare the soldiers for World War One, And the flu would just come, blow in there and... Oh, just it was devastating. Yeah, and the other thing is is that uh, in no way to minimize our our friend COVID nineteen, but you know back then they estimate somewhere around six hundred and seventy five thousand Americans died from the flu. That was at a time when the population was about a third of what it is today. So if you r r roughly multiply that by three, that would be you know the equivalent of two million people dying from it today. So the nineteen eighteen flu, man, that was that was something. It was a uh, amazing how contagious it was, how many people died worldwide, and just what a huge impact. And like I say, you you may be here because of the 1918 flu. That's a, a one of those uh, interesting stories, Marty. I know it devastated my father because he never knew his dad. So that's why they named him Martin Luther Watts. Yes. And I'm Martin Luther Watts Jr. Technically, I'm Martin Luther Watts III. Right. But that's how we got the name. That's how I kept the name. But, you know, the thing is, it's incredible. He didn't have a dad. And, you know, we're talking about these black communities and these communities and minorities where there's not mothers and dads around. It does affect you psychologically when you don't have a dad. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the coach we just talked about, my dad, his uh, father died from rheumatic fever uh, complications from the streptococcus infection when he was like in third grade. And man, I think it, it acted him. He had to repeat the third grade. So that was one of my dad's stories he always loved to tell is that, you know, you think you had it tough in school. I had to spend two years in third grade, but that's how devastating it can be to, to uh, you know, lose a parent. So can you imagine in 1919, you're, you're a single, you're a widow with three kids, one on the way. My dad was born on December the 29th, 1918. Yeah, and, 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 and it was not as easy for women to uh, get gainful employment, you know, just a so lot, she, you know, not the social net, the social safety net, as they call it. It's crazy. She worked in a, in a, in a hat shop. Women yeah. wore a lot of hats. Yeah. And everybody had the work, and they had, she had all these kids. She ended up marrying a barber. He was 50 years old. In the 1930 census, it shows up he was 50, she was 37, but he was an alcoholic, and she ended up getting out of that thing. And she ended up marrying a guy named John Rogers, who was a cousin to jo Will Rogers. He had a, he was part Osage, and she lived in the Osage mm -hmm. Indian Reservation up in Sky Tuke. But with that saying, it was a tough life. My dad didn't have it easy. And my mother... My mother was born in Iowa. And by the way, when my when my grandfather got out of the army, the Fort Dodge, he had a cousin that owned a bank in uh, Farnsville, Iowa. And my mm -hmm. mother was born in Iowa, and that's how he got started in the banking business. But with that saying, he survived. My other grandfather didn't. And of course, he's the reason why I'm here because my mother was, and he could have passed away. But what's the sad story was, my grandfather. 
lived till about 89 years old. He was in a rest home, and his his memory was going, but he would always go back to this guy named Willie Smith. He was talking about his boyhood buddy, Will, little Willie, right. and Willie went to. And then I, when I started thinking about it, who's Willie? And Willie was the kid that lived in the farm next to his farm, and they grew up together. And he was, and both of them joined the army, World War One, or they got drafted, and he went. He survived the flu, and he went to Bellawood and died. And so it was a sad story. So about a year ago, I started looking up how many people died in World War I from Oklahoma. How many, and, and he was on the list. And so it's, it's kind of sad how history changes. But if he, if he didn't stay in the – I mean, he was in recovery to October. If he went overseas, he might have never come back. Yeah, because, you know, uh, war is always hell as the, as the saying goes. But, boy, World War I with its trench warfare and chemical uh, agents <clears throat> being done. And, you know, I read a, I read a World War I story about how uh, second lieutenants, the kind of uh, – Commanders on the front would have a life expectancy of less than a week because the other side would try to shoot at the uh, second lieutenants because they were the ones in charge. But just how brutal that was back then. Oh yeah, and 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 so you know that we're talking about one of the segments with Eisenhower playing against Jim Thorpe and and George mm -hmm. Patton was on the he was the team manager of the Army football team. Right. But that's how he he learned those tank tactics in World War One. He got there at the end. Eisenhower didn't get to World War One. He was in World War One, but he was stationed over in America training people. So he never got the fight actually on the battleground like Patton and Douglas MacArthur right. did. Well, the the other thing, Marty, I wanted to, to get your take on is, you know, we have a lot of science and we have a lot of medicine and a lot of technology, but you know, the 1918 uh, pandemic, it's come back. We have COVID-19 now. We haven't made a lot of progress against viruses as a, as the human race. So it's it's crazy how, you know, you wouldn't think something from 1918 over 100 years ago would have relevance in terms of perspective about what's going on today with all the advances we've made in science. But, man, it sure does. What I'm a, I, I, you know, I agree that the wear of masks. I think masks is real important. I mean, we got our masks here, but we're, we're six feet away. We're six feet away. We got them from when we're not. I've got it right here, folks, just so you know, I, 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 I meet the regulation. But with that saying, you know what I'm upset with some of these governors, and I don't want to call them liberal conservative because if I, if I name them one part, but they were a bunch of hypocrites with these riots. They let these people go out in the streets. Some of them weren't wearing masks. And I think some of this resurgent is part of that. And, and, of course, I do think that the young kids are not doing social distancing. I don't think they're doing a very good job of it. Well, the other thing is, unlike the 1918 influenza, where it took people in the prime, where a lot of times if you get a bad case of it, get in your lungs, your own immune system being strong would kill you. The COVID tends to be an older person's disease. You can get it when you're young, but very lot fewer deaths. And so it just makes sense that that's the case, but that doesn't necessarily make it right. And uh, hopefully we will get this thing under control. Yeah, and, and please, people who watch this podcast, please be safe. Please wear a mask. Be, be cognizant of, of your distance. And if you're going to go to a restaurant, make sure you, you, you're, you're separate from people. But right now, we're still at a critical stage. And I'm just telling, I want to tell you how it affects my family. This, the last big pandemic it affected my family. It's been over 100 years ago, but boy, it changed my family life. Yeah. Great story. I appreciate you sharing that. Thanks, Marty. So we're going to go back and we're going to talk about the history of baseball, the game of rounders and cricket. So we're going to come back to the next segment. going to be a great story because I'm going to talk about how cricket and rounders formed the game of baseball. But my story goes back to 1988. I'm, I'm in San Francisco. I'm playing for the San Francisco Old Boys rugby team. That time I was a little over 30 years old. And on my team, there's a lot of guys who were members of British Petroleum. 
and there were some guys that worked for from New Zealand, and they played rugby. But when in the off season, they they had it. We had a cricket team, cricket, and cricket is one of the founders. One one of the I guess the the grandfather of baseball, that and rounders. And and the reason why I started playing cricket is that when the rugby season ended, these guys would go out to the nets in Marin County. Now, if you know where Marin County is, that's where Sausalito, it's where uh, Mill Valley, it's right over the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, kind of just north and, a, what, a little east of San Francisco, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I lived in Marin County, and I was playing rugby, and so this kid, I, and I, I was, I played baseball in high school. I was a baseball player. And one of the guys said, well, you know, Marty, I, you could probably be a decent cricket player. Well, at that time, I was in my 30s, so I didn't, I was going to become a great batsman, but I was a good fielder. And I started playing on the cricket team, and I started going on these cricket tours all over California. <laughs> we went to Georgia, but we, mostly California, and I actually played against one of the oldest clubs of all time, the Hollywood Cricket Club, and Boris Karloff was still alive. He formed that club with Earl Flynn. <laughs> they were, so what happened was back in Hollywood, back in the 30s and 20s, these British actors came over, and that, and that was their game, cricket. And so they played over uh, the, the Hollywood grounds. They had their own grounds, their own cricket. And, you know, uh, famous thing about cricket is cucumber sandwiches. They had tea between innings. And so baseball got its beginnings with innings and the box score off in the game of cricket. So I started playing cricket. So, Marty, how big is the ball in the cricket? Is it? And, you know, I know, you know, I've seen it in movies, but I don't think I've ever seen a cricket game. So, so there's, the cricket game is, they go by one day cricket, you usually play 29 overs. Over is six balls. A bowler is like an equivalent of American pitcher. Right. And he throws it overhand. And usually there's, I think there's 15 players on a cricket team. And, and usually if it came down to me as a batsman, we were done because you, you and you play, you play an inning. Each team plays one inning. And one inning, and you get 10 outs. So out is if you caught the ball or if you hit the, what they call the wickets, right. the stumps. And if you knock the stumps down, that's the guy's out. Or if he, he hits the ball. Or if he goes between the two stumps for runs and then you throw him out. And so I had to learn a new game, but I became pretty good at it. I was never a great batsman. I was a great defensive player, and I led the league in catches. A hat trick is if you caught three catches in a game. Now, do you have do you have gloves in cricket? Is the ball bigger or smaller than a baseball, harder, softer? It's the same size as a baseball. Okay. And the wicket keeper is the only one that has gloves. Okay. Everyone else is just bare hands. Bare hands. And then you had to catch. Boy, that ball was really stinging when you catch it. But... The bowlers would throw the ball around 90 to 100 miles an hour. And that that's when I figured out how can I become a star on a cricket team because I was never going to be a great batsman. Right. There was this guy from Tasmania. Remember the Tasmania Devil? Yes. Outside of Australia, there's an island called Tasmania. And the Warner Brothers cartoon <laughs> would spin around, I believe. The Tasmania <laughs> Devil. Well, this guy, this guy, uh, one day I was in the nets and he said, you know what, Marty, I'm going to teach you a pitch called the googly. Now, the googly is is the American equivalent of a screwball. So I hope the camera gets me. So when, the ball, so when you throw a screwball, you go like this. When you throw a, a, a curveball, you go like this. Jerry Seinfeld talks about the googly in one of his commercials. That's I didn't know what it was. So in a cricket game... You know how baseball, you start out with your fastball pitcher right. speed, and you bring in the relief pitchers during the game. And each pitcher, bowler in a cricket game, he only gets six overs. So you have to use your pitchers just right. Where I would come in, they're used to that fast speed. I come in and throw that googly, that off-speed pitch, that bounce. It's a screwball. Because the American equivalent is a screwball. So you were the equivalent, yeah, uh of you, Tug, John Tug McGraw. Yeah, or, or Raleigh Fingers throwing the, you know, throwing the Neckler. You know, I mean, I know or it's the, a different the spitball. Yeah, the spitball. They're even better. So, so, cool. so I figure, well, hey, you know what? I, I, if I can learn my master the Grigley, I've got a spot on this cricket team. And they're going on tour. And so I would go to the Nets every day and learn. And he taught me. He was from Tasmania. And he was Australian, you know. And so he taught me how to throw this Googly. And I became really good at that. 
and so I would play rugby in the in the in the fall and, and cricket in the spring, and I had a great career. And of course, there was a famous pub in San Rafael called the Mayflower Pub, and boy, they had Scotch eggs and they had the famous British beer, and we had we played darts. You know, the English love darts. <laughs> So, yeah. Marty, I want you to do something. Smile for the camera. Yeah. Are those your real teeth? Because a lot of my people, a lot of my friends I know yeah. that played a lot of rugby, they don't have their originals. Did you manage to yeah. keep yours? Yeah. Okay, well, good. That's good because a lot of them don't. It's a, that, that rugby is a rough sport. So my greatest moment in cricket is we're playing the Hollywood cricket team down in Hollywood. Yes. And the game came down. They had, they had nine outs, and there were four runs to get by us there, and, and, it, and this guy hit this line drive, it was like, like a line drive catch, and I grabbed the ball, and I caught it, just before it hit the grass, it was controversy, but I, that the game ended, and there was almost a fight in the stand, oh, he didn't catch it, and finally the umpire ruled it was a catch, and the game ended, and that was my greatest moment, because we beat the famous Hollywood Cricket Club, the Marin Cricket Club from San, Northern California, and so with that, I started looking up the, the game of baseball, and basically baseball came from two sports, rounders. Now, rounders is a game that played back in the 18th, 17th century in England, and it has four bases. There's four bases. Right. They play with a ball and a bat, so that's where we got nine players on each team. So that's where a lot of the baseball rules came from, rounders. And of course, cricket gave the game of the bowler, the innings, the box score, they, they, so what happened was when these colonists came over to the United States, around 1790, around 1820, they started playing rounders, and they started forming their own baseball type, their own rules, you know, Americans, we yeah. want to change things, and so it all, I'm looking at my notes, it all started around 1829, and there was this team called the Knickerbockers from, from New York, and they formed this thing called baseball, and they, they formulated the rules of the game, and it was it was a little bit of cricket and rounders. And to this day, most people in England, when they see an American baseball game, the first thing they think, oh, that's rounders. That's a form of rounders. Yes. And so rounders goes back to the Tudor days. So if you take those two sports, that's how we came up with the game of baseball. And, as, and it all came back. And then one of the things is in 1837, that's when they formed the Knickerbocker Club. There, were a, there was a bunch of guys – who put this team together. They were from Manhattan, but they would play their games in, is it Hogan? Hogan, um, what's in New Jersey where Frank Sinatra's from? Oh, Hoboken. Hoboken. Yes. That's where the first baseball game. Now, here is the thing that really gets me. Somebody came up, and I'm going to look at my notes here, but how did they come up with 90 feet from home plate to first base? Now, they figured out if they made it 85 feet, then nobody could get out. They would get to, but if it was 95 feet, everybody would get thrown out. Somebody came up with that 90 feet, and it was called the magical 90 feet. And I guess, uh, I guess on the close, if the bases were 85 feet apart, the close plays would, would be easy, safe calls. And then, so really, the 90 feet was a genius who came up with 90 feet. So can you imagine? If the ball, if the if it was 94 feet, how many guys would have beat out the, the hit? A lot, right? Yes. But if it was 89 feet or 87, a lot of people would not get in field hits, right? Yeah, absolutely. So how did the, the brilliant of 90 feet? Hey, and was there a guy named Abner Doubleday? Did you come across that in your research? It just something hits me from a book I read maybe back in eighth grade or something. Well, so. Spalding, back at the around 1904, they were formulating the history of baseball, and somebody said that General Ab Aberdeen Doubleday, yeah, who was from Cooperstown, and he was a general in World War. He was a general in the Civil War. Was the guy that formulated baseball, and he didn't. Okay, so that's uh, not true then, right? Cooperstown's not the home of baseball. It's a fantasy, but but somehow it got in everybody's head. Though Cooperstown's the town, but all because of Spalding, he owned the sporting yeah. goods, and I. And so the thing about it is, I was looking up the guy who invented the the curveball. His name was Candy Cummings. Cummings. You probably never heard of that. Name. I've never heard of Candy Cummings. He was he was on Corny Island. He was a young guy playing baseball, and he was 
he was he was playing he was throwing he was throwing sh seashells, and he was throwing the seashell, and he noticed that when he did it, the seashell would would curve, would twist. Yeah. In the air, and the, the guys started using. He said, "Well, maybe I had to try this on a baseball." And and but but here's the thing is, let's go back to cricket. Cricket as a bowler has what they call a spinner. A spinner. Mm -hmm. So he saw that. So he figured, well, maybe I could just take a baseball and make it curve like a, like a shell. And that's how. He, and he started. He played in 1874, and that's where the curveball. They claim he's the guy that invented the curveball. There might have been some other guys, but he gets the name in the record books. Yeah, and he was the one who at least he would must have been thrown a pretty mean curve to have be associated with so it you, at a minimum. Do you think of Sandy Koufax and Warren Spahn? They developed that great curveball. They all owe it to little Candy Cummings there, and um, I guess he was on the beach there in Coney Island. That's it. So, Marty, you ever play wiffle ball with the yes. wiffle ball that has the holes in it? Yeah. So if you throw the ball with the holes on the side, it would curve this way. You turn it, it would go the other way. And if you did straight down, it would just be the fastball or the sinker. That's the, that's the only curve I could ever throw. So so that's how all this came about. So we owe the game of baseball to rounders and cricket. And, and that experience I had playing cricket and, and rugby was a great experience. I think I might be one of the few Americans that ever played rugby and cricket that wasn't a, not from England or for another country. And, I, you know, the thing is, through that, through that cricket connection, when I was working for Microtech, IT training company, I had to work with a lot of Indian companies from mm -hmm. India. And you know, India and Pakistan, that's their biggest sport. To this day, right? Cricket's huge in that part so of the world. So when Pakistan plays India, it's civil war. It's, yeah. It's, uh, they kill each other. But I will tell you this. I made more business deals because I understood cricket and I could talk that cricket cricket language to these IT guys from India. Yes. And they love me. Oh, you know cricket. And, I, we, and we, and you know, in an Indian game, when they have a break between the innings, they had curry. They get that hot food curry. Yeah. And they had a hot tea. So the English brought the game of cricket to India, and now it's the biggest sport in India. So, Marty, do you, what were your uniforms back then? Like oh, back then, oh, oh, just my. like. And do you have a bat by chance anymore from I, back in the day? Yes, I got one in my garage. All right, cool. And, and then if you want to go up and to the website, go, look up the Marine Cricket Club. It's one of the oldest clubs in, in, in the United States, and I was a member of that team. And to this day, I most of those guys, I'm, some of the guys who are my age now are not playing anymore. But boy, that was a magical 1988. What a season! I played 89 and 90. I really played three seasons, but I learned to throw that googly. And, and, and can you imagine an American throwing a screwball called the googly? No, that's pretty good. So you're probably one of the only googly throwers here in uh, all, all of our state, this part of the country. Good job. And, you know, and of course, the grounds, they play in cricket. Uh, do we have much time left, Jimmy? I guess we got about a minute left. But, but we had our own grounds crew. I mean, and all the connection. And then, you know, it's funny. When I went to work in Chicago for the IT company, guess who I picked up as a big client? British Petroleum. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it does pay to, to know the guys are in the, in, the, in the inside. And most of those guys were upper management guys. So what if, so anybody has ever looked up, look up the sport of rounders and cricket and how it became the game of baseball. So I think the next segment we're going to get on and, and we're going to talk about Scottish Games and the song Amazing Grace. Well, welcome back to our last segment, segment three, episode eight. And, and by the way, to finish up the story about, about cricket, I was in the Mayflower pub, I think it was 89, and Huey Lewis and the the news, you know, the rock and roll band. Yes, absolutely. I remember, they were in, they were in uh, those those movies, Back to the Future. They mm -hmm. had this Power of Love, one of their hit songs, yes. Power of Love. So anyway, he shows up in the pub, and we're sitting there playing darts, and, and he saw us in our cricket outfits, and all, all white outfits, and he said, "You know, Marty, he says I'm doing a, I'm going to be doing an album," and he lived in Mill Valley at the time. He lived in Marin County, and so he came up to me and this guy named. Uh, Jackson and we said you know 
uh, we can help you. So, you know, I want to do a cover album, you know, you know, the cover of the album. Yeah. I want to wear a cricket outfit and a bat. And so I gave him my bat and we got him some cricket outfit. And if you look it up, I think you can go up to Google and look up Huey News, uh, Huey Lewis and the news. You'll see my cricket bat and that uniform was given by one of the other guys and he's in it. Oh, awesome. So this segment, we're going to talk about last week would have been the 36th annual Chicago Highland Games. And they had to cancel the game because of the virus. And and for the years I lived in Chicago, I was on the committee of the I was on the Chicago Games Committee mm-hmm. and, and and it was the St. Andrew Society of Illinois. And I the thing that, that was amazing, we put on the rugby we had a seven side rugby tournament and we would bring in about twenty five to thirty thousand people at the Oak Brook Polo Fields. Oak Brook is a suburb of Chicago, but they had this gigantic polo fields. And we would bring, you know, uh, rugby, soccer. We had we had the Scotty's Athletics. You've heard of the cable toss and, and the stone throw, the hammer throw. And I was involved with the rugby part of it. And, of course, I had many friends who were in the bagpipe band, and they would bring in at least 25 to 30 bands. And that's a lot of bagpipe bands. That's a, that's a lot of bagpipes, absolutely. And... and and the thing I really miss is at the end of the games, they would march on the field playing the song Scotland the Brave. And that's a, kind of like a Notre Dame type fight song. Everybody gets pumped up. When you hear Scotland the Brave, you can't get, you know. <laughs> now, my connection as Scottish, my grandmother on my mother's side, my great grandmother, her maiden name was Bruce. And, you know, you've heard the, the great king, you know, Bruce. King, yeah. Robert the Bruce. Yes. And so I had a Bruce Kelt. I was I was all outfitted. Yeah, yeah, you can't. I was lot. I was leaner in those days, but but I remember they march off with playing the song "Scotland the Brave." And at the very end, they would play. I think one of the greatest Scottish bagpipe songs of all time, "Amazing Grace." Yes. What's your feeling about that song? Well, you know, I used to uh, attend regularly a Lutheran church, and they were big on Amazing Grace, all the uh, verses. So, yeah. And then on the bagpipes, there was something about it. You know, the bagpipes, there's not a lot of songs where you say, that song would be great on bagpipe. But, but that, Amazing that, Grace goes very well on it. And, and you know, I've gone to funerals, and, and, and usually Amazing Grace is always a song that right. people choose. But when you hear 25 bands playing that song... It is an amazing song. And so I went and did some history of that song, and that song was written in 1779 by a guy named John Newton. Now, here is, and he became, a, he was a minister in England. But his story is amazing. When he was a younger guy, he was on a slave ship. He ran a slave ship of slaves. And he, he found how bad it was, and he, and one day he decided, I can't do this anymore. And he, so he came up with, he he went to the English government and said, we've got to abolish slavery. And I think this was around 1765 or 70. You know, they started the movement to abolish slavery. The English abolished slavery. It was because of John Newton. But one night he was sitting there and he, and he just, he, he wrote down some words, amazing grace, the grace of God. And that's how he came up with the song. And that song is fun. And all because of slavery, because of the, and he decided slavery is wrong. And we all know it is. And he just, he was the guy that really kind of changed the whole story for the English. Now, it did, it took the United States up until 1860, what, five or 64 to officially end slavery, you know. But with that saying, Amazing Grace came out of that whole slavery trade ship. And he was a captain of the boat. Yeah, so it is very interesting these modern times where we look at people. And so if you were to look at uh, Mr. Newton in his early career, it'd probably be tough to come up with anyone that would be more despicable in his choice of trade. Right. You know, having said where he went from to where he went to, uh, it is it, it is interesting. You know, in this kind of canceled era that we're in, does that mean that Amazing Grace doesn't get to be played? Or is it show for what it really is? A guy who knew he was really off the track about as far as you could get and tried to find his way back. So very interesting. The story, the the real the story I know, 
that he was in a, in a bad storm. The ship was about to go down, and he asked for, and that's when he realized, what was he doing on the ship with all these slaves? And, they, and the ship almost went down, and that's when he decided, I have to get out of this. We've got to change life. And it was a moment in life, and that's how he wrote that song, Amazing Grace. So, you know, it's one of, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest songs ever written, but it came out of that incident. It's hard to believe that, you know? No, it is hard to believe. And so, yeah, uh, hopefully when we uh, produce this, we'll have some bagpipes playing Amazing Grace in the background, because I'm sure hearing it in my head right now, Marty. Well, you know, and we have games here in New Mexico called the Real Grand Kelty Games, but they've mm -hmm. been canceled. But when I brought up the Chicago games, we would get twenty-five to 30,000 people. Now, a lot of people in the 19th century came from Scotland and Ireland to Chicago. Right. Your your family were German, right? Yeah, Germans, and they Greece. lived on the south side once they made it from the foreign country, kind of in closer to the middle of Chicago. So it, it, Chicago was a magnet of all these minorities, and the Scottish people came there, and they, and they have this thing called the Scottish home. If you if you have any Scottish blood in you, they have a home for retirement people, and you can qualify for it. As long as you show them that you have Scottish blood in you, they would... They would find ways to find it, and we would raise. I was one year we raised about three hundred to four hundred thousand every year for the home, and then we would get funding from people. And we kept people who couldn't afford a rest home would go to yeah. the Scott, and the Scottish home is still there. It's called El, and it's supported by the St. Andrew Society of Illinois. So that was one of the things I really miss about living there is being involved with these games and the bagpipes. And I, uh, I think if you. If you look at the Scottish history, it's it's not it's not great. The, a lot of you know a lot of infighting, and the you know of course the Battle of Culloden. That's a battle. The, the last battle where the where the Highlanders uh, revolted. That, that was the, yeah. That was Highland the uh, Highlanders Waterloo. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, Culloden. Yeah, I am uh, forced mildly against my will to watch the Outlander series. So uh, that is uh, that is loosely based on that. We also want to say uh, a person from Scotland is a Scot. Right. A person who drinks scotch is a drinker. But <laughs> so the point of it is it's so funny growing up, people would say he was scotch. It's like, no, the Scots would tell you scotch is the drink, Scott is the person. Well, you know, and, you know, I didn't realize single malt whiskey, boy, they have so many varieties of right. single malt whiskey. And we would have whiskey tasting thing. And. I would go to these things, and after about three hits, I just couldn't take it. But, but if, you, if you find a good single malt whiskey, it's pretty good, but you have to acquire a taste for it. It's not something I would recommend to drink every day, but it's, it's, it, they're famous for their scotch whiskey. Yeah, and I've, I've, I'm not much of a drinker anymore, but uh, back uh, when I used to imbibe a little more, yeah, some of those single malts are... Very interesting. A lot of them have a very earthy, kind of that peat moss flavor oh, to them. Yeah. A lot of that, that rich, smoky flavor. And you drink it, it's just like, it uh, it takes over your whole body. You know, that in a cigar, and I used to wake up the next morning and say, what did I do to myself? So it's like, it's uh, some powerful, powerful spirits. Now, the, you've heard of the cable toss. It's a big telephone pole. Yes. And you flip it over, and a perfect throw is 12 o'clock hot. Okay. And that's how they grade it. But so is it distance and accuracy or both? Yeah, you have, to, you have to pick it up and throw it, but you have to, you have to turn it over. Yeah. And if it hits 12 o'clock, that's what they call a perfect pitch. Right. If it goes one, two, three, and that's how you get judged. Okay. And I'll tell you, I try to – they have different weights – but I'll tell you, it's it takes a skilled person to do that. And boy, when you go to the Highland Games, the caber toss is the big draw. People love to watch it. So how much does it weigh, round numbers? Do you remember? God, I remember the one I threw was about 150 pounds. It was pretty heavy. So that's heavy to pick up, much less to heat. Yeah, you had to hold it like this yeah. and flip it. And, and you had to be pretty strong. I mean, so, uh, you know, they... For a long time, they had a professional tour of, of these heavy events. Yeah. People got paid. I think in, at the Highland Games we did in Chicago, the winners got three, four thousand dollars. So they were paid a bit, and they would go to other Highland Games and compete against each other. It's kind of like the Ironman contest. Right. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. And of course, that's why I, I brought this subject up because they would have had their 
35th straight Highland Games. They didn't have it this year. So it's kind of sad. Okay, and so cue the sad bat bagpipe music on that. And Marty, I want to say uh, we need to get a picture of you in a kilt. I want to see that. So I, I do have a couple of pictures. <laughs> but, but thank God of Robert the Bruce. And by the way, there's a movie. If you want to go up to Netflix, they have a movie on Robert the Bruce. Yes. Let's go up there and watch it. He was a unique guy. He followed William Wallace. You saw that movie with, with uh, what was the name of that the movie with William Wallace with the, uh, the the guy from Australia, the famous actor. Oh, Crow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Crow. Um, not Crocodile Dundee. No, no, I, Crow. What is it? Um, <laughs> you know, the, the Max, the guy that played the, the, well, the Max oh, series. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It'll come to me. We're flashing it up on the screen at the bottom here. So. Yeah, we'll flash yeah. it up here. Um, my memory's going bad. When I get to that point, but, <laughs> uh, but I will tell you this, uh, what a great history of the bagpipes. And if you get a chance, you could go up to YouTube, you, YouTube, is it iTunes, iTunes. Yes. And you can, there, you can hear some great variation of Amazing Grace on the bagpipes and the music. It's beautiful. So anyway, I think this is going to end our segment eight. And Wally, I really thank you for, for being part of this thing. And by the way, if you really like what we're talking about, go up to Facebook and hit the word follow and like. And then go to YouTube and hit the subscriber. All you have to do is type in America Talk It Up. And we just want you to be part of it. And give me some comments. Tell me what we should do better. But we're just trying to, I'm just telling stories about my life, about history. So, as we would say with Henry, we used to end it with this thing. We go, Ashababa, and we would say, Olay. 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 <laughs>